Thank you very much um, for the opportunity uh, to present to the Melanoma Research Foundation on the SECURE OM Symposium. I wish to thank Dr. Patel and other members for inviting me. Uh, today, I'd like to talk a little bit about intratumoral immunotherapy for cancer. Uh, it seems that uh, everywhere you turn, um, the talk on the street is how immunotherapy is clearly uh, going to be a benefit for our cancer patients. So why is this important? It's important because our current methods of treating cancer are not working. Number one, um, the number of cases of cancer is actually going to increase tremendously and our ability to use the current uh, paradigm for treating cancer is not going to be able to fulfill the obligations we have towards these patients. The side effects of these treatments are very common. Uh, the infrastructure required to treat these patients is um, very um, technology dependent, uh, very resource infrastructure uh, dependent. So uh, what we're looking for is a new modality to treat cancer. Uh, furthermore, many of these treatments are rarely curative. There's a lot of optimism, particularly in the area of melanoma, as uh, this audience probably already knows that with the introduction of CTLA-4 inhibitor, ipilimumab, um, as well as the pd one inhibitors, uh, we do know that we're able to actually cure a previously incurable cancer uh, by using immunotherapy alone. So why does inter role interventional radiology plays for immunotherapy? Well, interventional radiology has been you know, typically heralded by uh, the use of um, various uh, image-guided uh, procedures uh, really to overcome those physical barriers where you're unable to get to the tumor. Uh, we can do this um, and inject um, or use it to uh, deliver treatments were otherwise thought to be very toxic when administered in a systemic fashion and increase their bioavailability at the source. Immunotherapy on their hand is uh, thought to be very specific for the tumor. Uh, there's memory, so if the tumor were to come back, um, immunotherapy, which uh, we've actually been able to use, uh, will actually be able to keep the tumor in check. And it's very adoptable, depending upon uh, if, you know, if the tumor were to mutate or develop new antigens, the immunotherapy itself, which had been used in the first place, should be able to, uh, again, work for uh, these recurrent tumors. So do we have any evidence to support the fact that, you know, things that uh, we've been able to use in the past, or um, if we look historically for a historical precedent, precedent, has there been anything uh, similar in the past to know that um, these various immunotherapeutic options that actually can or uh, do work? And the answer is yes. Um, it's well known uh, in literature where uh, so-called cancers have regressed spontaneously with the induction of fever or inflammation. Um, and uh, various interesting techniques were used to actually generate these fever and inflammatory responses, including one which has actually been uh, used by uh, Dr. Coley, who is, um, we'll discuss that further. Um, he is um, considered to be the father of immunotherapy. Um, at the turn of the last century, he was using um, a broth essentially of streptococcal as well as um, uh, uh, serratia um, bacteria to uh, treat cases in which he was actually injecting this directly into tumors, sometimes intradermally, sometimes intravenously, sometimes subcutaneously. But it was found that if it was injected directly into tumorally, in particular in case of sarcoma, that uh, you could actually induce cures. And this was sort of lost um, to the wayside until some of the resurrections occurred in around nine, in the 70s and 60s. There was a uh, NCI-led conference in uh, November 1976. And it was clearly noted that uh, these things do occur as in spontaneous regressions of cancer induced by various um, um, various means to induce inflammation. It can occur, we can achieve cures. So we're trying to mimic that. We're trying to convert these tumors from a pro-tumor environment to an anti-tumor environment. In other words, the tumor milieu itself has to be changed to uh, be able to um, 
cause or to uh, make the tumors essentially um, auto-vaccinate. So we, uh, the pro-tumor microenvironment is characterized by regulatory T cells, tumor state of macrophages, ideal dendritic cells, and myeloid derived stem cells. We're able to uh, uh, make tumors regress by using um, uh, various techniques, which I'll describe in a second, to uh, cause more CD4 T uh, T helper cells, CD8 cytotoxic T cells, natural killer cells, or B lymphocytes to permeate the tumor. We do that by uh, administering various um, um, types of materials directly into tumors, either uh, bacteria, uh, viruses, TLR agonists, interleukins, uh, cellular therapies such as genetic cells, CAR T cells, um, and also chemo and radiation is known to actually enhance the immune responsiveness to tumors. This is an index case that we actually treated uh, with uh, administering dendritic cells directly into the tumor. We can actually see that we're actually causing a pro-inflammatory uh, response in the tumor, converting it from uh, a hot to a cold tumor. This was a patient where we injected dendritic cells directly into the tumor. And over time, you can actually see the population of CD4 and CD8 uh, cells increasing the tumor, basically converting this to a immune responsive type of tumor. Um, number one, number two, you can actually see the on the right hand side of your screen the likelihood of actually inducing a PDL1 um, um, response in the tumor. In other words, we could actually combine this with various PDL1 inhibitors, which is basically the backbone of where we're going with various tumor anti tumor therapies. This case is actually uh, a case which we were actually able to. Um, convert a previously unresponsive tumor to ipilimumab to a responsive tumor. This was a gentleman who was in hospice um, after a period of time, um, basically two cycles of intratermal immunotherapy de delivered directly into the small subcutaneous nodule and nodule and axilla through a single needle. We're able to convert this large area of tumor burden um, to basically uh, one where there was no tumor at all. He had a complete response. He's alive five years after the injection. It gives me a lot of hope to see how these therapies may be useful in the future. This gives you an idea of where we are right now. Uh, we've treated over 300 patients at MD Anderson on these various clinical trials. Well, 30 of these patients actually had melanoma. We've injected various um, 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 agents into tumors. TLR agonists, sting agonists, various gene therapy, CD40 agonists, uh, viral uh, uh, bacterial therapies, radiation therapy, um, chelated radiation therapy directly into tumors, into various locations of the body. Um, these, um, in total, uh, there were almost 1,500 intraterminal injections. This, this data, which I'm actually presenting right now, uh, is from the end of 2019. Obviously, our program has continued since then. The important take-home point is that we can do these safely. Um, you know, less than 1% of patients actually had any adverse re uh, reaction related to the injection or to the agents. And most of these injections were done with ultrasound guidance, which actually means that this can be done very easily in the community or in an outpatient office. So I think um, I'll set the stage for Dr. Sheff, who will be talking subsequently on uh, where we're going with this. To date, um, uh, image guidance has been very useful or very flexible um, in terms of its ability, uh, our ability to harness that to deliver these agents in various sites in the body. Uh, we've been able to deliver to very superficial targets, which are basically a centimeter underneath the skin to various deep targets, which are deep within the liver without problems. Um, in addition to that, we've been able to actually biopsy the, um, these tumors to know what's going on at the site where of injection and also at the site remote from the injection. Because, um, you know, um, so we're looking for those so-called abscopal responses. And um, I think this, this is actually uh, data which should be coming out shortly. Um, but there are some shortcomings, and uh, we're looking at various ways to actually improve our ability to um, uh, enhance responsiveness in the tumors. And um, again, like I said, I'll set the stage for Dr. Shack 
and he'll follow. Thank you. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Bruno Odizio. I'm an interventional radiologist at MD Anderson Cancer Center. And uh, what I want to show today uh, is some of the uh, treatment options we have in interventional radiology for patients with melanoma uh, presenting with liver metastasis. So just a brief introduction about what is interventional radiology. It's a medical subspecialty that minimally invasive procedures using medical imaging guidance, such as X-ray uh, machines, uh, such as CT scans or uh, fluoroscopy machines, MRI, ultrasound, and so on. There is a sub-branch of interventional radiology called intervention oncology, where uh, we have interventional radiologists like myself, and Dr. Sheff and Dr. Murphy, uh, that you're gonna meet today, uh, that uh, practice uh, dedicated uh, to the care of patients with cancer. And uh, on that scenario, we uh, uh, work uh, providing diagnosis, treatment, and palliation for such patients. So what I will focus today on my presentation is about the treatment of the melanoma uh, liver metastasis. Uh, and why this is important? We know that patients with uh, uh, melanoma they present uh, quite frequently with liver metastasis. Patients with cutaneous form of melanoma, they present with liver metastasis with 15 to 20% of the time, uh, whereas patients with uveal melanoma, up to 90% of those patients, they will eventually present with liver metastatic disease during the course of their disease. We also know uh, that uh, uh, immunotherapy has played a major role and have achieved great advances uh, on the management of patients with melanoma, especially in patients with a cutaneous melanoma. But we also know that given some distinct uh, clinical pathological uh, features, uh, the liver metastasis from melanoma, they tend to be less responsive to immunotherapy. And it is on this particular scenario that we feel that applying local regional therapies to the liver uh, might be helpful for uh, this patient population uh, with a melanoma liver metastasis. So every time we apply a local regional therapy uh, to a patient with any type of cancer, we always need to make a balance between being able to provide effective local tumor control uh, while we're able to preserve the target organ, in this case, the liver. So we want to preserve the liver function and um, as important, even more important, we also to, uh, want to preserve the quality of life of the patients that we are uh, providing this local regional therapy. So this is something very important to keep in mind every time we see a play patient on the clinic. Uh, we want to maximize their local tumor control, but also we need to take uh, the sort of whole holistic approach uh, to the patient care, uh, where the most important thing is to uh, maintain the quality of life of those patients. So the way that we work on a multidisciplinary panel, uh, every time we got consulted by our medical oncologist colleagues or surgical oncologists uh, about the patient, we always do uh, a patient clinical and we evaluate the clinical condition, the disease staging, what kind of therapies the patient had or is having right now, and uh, the overall goals of care. Once we make this decision between the multidisciplinary team and the patient, uh, we evaluate the liver disease extent. And based on that, we take a look on the uh, functional status of the liver. And uh, Finally, we take a look on the size, number, and distribution of the tumors on the liver because that's what's going to determine what kind of local regional therapies we might offer for uh, those patients. So if we break uh, different types of liver metastasis uh, in major three groups, we're going to see that on the left side of the screen, you're going to see uh, patients with small size, limited number of liver tumors, Whereas on the right side of the screen, we can see uh, patients who, who have large widespread uh, disease distribution. And this kind of division between uh, tumor burden uh, help us to determine what kind of local regional therapy we would apply for those patients. So for instance, patients with small uh, uh, tumor burden on the liver, they might be a candidate for uh, liver ablation 
whereas patients with more advanced disease, uh, they usually are offer uh, radioembolization. Uh, there is something between those two patients where we can uh, offer uh, chemoembolization or immunoembolization. I'm not going to talk about this too, uh, today because I, I try to focus on the uh, most extreme uh, sides uh, in terms of disease distribution. So let's talk about liver ablation first. Liver ablation is a minimum invasive uh, technique that uses extreme heat to destroy the cancer uh, while preserving healthy tissue. The goal of uh, liver ablation is to provide uh, a complete eradication of the tumor that we treat. So we aim to achieve cure uh, at that particular tumor that we're treating. We don't uh, expect to leave any tumor behind. Uh, we uh, always try to get that tumor completely, destroy the tumor completely, and also provide uh, what we call a safety margin uh, to uh, avoid any potential recurrence in the future. Typically, the indication for liver ablations is uh, for patients who are ineligible to surgery with a limited uh, liver disease, which means up to five tumors measuring up to three centimeters in size. Uh, just to uh, uh, illustrate the experience that has been published in the literature, uh, it's relatively, uh, I would say, limited because, unfortunately, most of the patients that we see in our clinic, they have more advanced disease and they ended up not being uh, eligible. Uh, for ablation. But if we take a look, for instance, on the Memorial Sloan Catherine Cancer uh, Center experience, uh, they published a series of 32 patients with resection. Of those 16 patients had ablation, and they compared the outcomes of those patients, and they saw that patients who uh, underwent ablation had a similar overall survival uh, compared to patients who had resection. Uh, Patients who had ablation, they tend to have more extra hepatic disease at the time of the presentation, and maybe that's the reason why uh, they uh, were elected to undergo ablation instead of surgery. But uh, overall, uh, overall survival rates are uh, similar, and uh, ablation being a much less aggressive uh, 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 local therapy when compared to surgery. Uh, same thing uh, from our European colleagues from Paris 5, uh, Institute Cluhy, uh, they uh, did an analysis and published 15 patients who underwent resection plus ablation. And uh, uh, this combination of resection, liver resection plus ablation, achieved a similar overall survival and disease free survival when compared to patients who had resection alone. This is just an example showing a patient who had several rounds of ablation, which is also a great advantage of this therapy. If the patients, uh, after the first round of ablation, they develop new lesions, we, depending on the size, location of such lesions, uh, we can bring the patient back in, on another round of ablation. So this patient here, you can see uh, there was a patient with uveal melanoma who developed these new liver metastases. This particular patient had a prior ablation from another liver metastasis he had here. Six months prior to this one, we did the ablation, and this is the CT done immediately again cavity uh, with total destruction of the tumor. Uh, it looks very right there. So if we go to the extreme situation now, talking about radioembolization, patients with uh, widespread uh, metastatic disease on the liver, uh, radioembolization is uh, what we call a transarterial radiation therapy. Instead of doing external beam radiation, we are delivering radiation therapy uh, through a catheter into the patient's uh, hepatic artery. By doing that, we deliver a single measure and target radiation dose. The rationale to do this intraarterial radiation is because we know that the normal liver is perfused in 90% of the blood volume coming from the portal vein. Uh, and if you have a tumor on your liver, that proportion converts about 90% of the blood supply to the tumor comes from the hepatic artery, only about 10% from the portal vein. So the idea is if you put a catheter on the hepatic artery, whatever you inject on that hepatic artery will mainly go towards the tumor while, while you're preserving uh, the normal liver to the deleterious effects of radiation or chemotherapy, for instance. And uh, the more vascular those tumors are, the more effective uh, the distribution of the radiation 
uh, beads into the tumor and by consequence, uh, the response of those tumors should be spared. So uh, just to show one of the uh, uh, studies that have been published in the literature, this is from the group from uh, Thomas Jefferson, uh, where they did a phase two trial uh, in patients with uveal melanoma, uh, and they subdivided uh, patients uh, who had uh, treatment naive group A or group B patients who had prior immune embolization to their tumors. Uh, and they showed that tumor uh, stabilization was more frequent on the patients who never had a, a prior immune embolization. Nevertheless, even on the patients who fail immune embolization, in about 60% of those patients, uh, uh, a re-embolization was able to provide uh, some tumor stabilization, which is a very critical uh, uh, measurement uh, of success on patients with uveal melanoma. Uh, in conclusions, uh, interventional radiology therapies uh, uh, they are an option for the treatment of melanoma liver metastasis. We have a wide range of local regional therapies such as ablation, chemo embolization, immune embolization, radio embolization. Uh, we don't have a lot of data to present at this moment, but I feel that the changes that we're seeing in the landscape with immunotherapy uh, for this special patient population will allow us to apply uh, such local regional therapies more frequently uh, to their uh, liver disease. And with that, we hope to generate more data, uh, more meaningful data uh, in that regards. And one final thing that I would like to uh, point out is it's very possible that we can use some of the local regional therapies we have to immune priming uh, the tumor microenvironment on the liver. And in combination with systemic immunotherapy, uh, we might uh, improve overall uh, response rates uh, in this patient population. So this is going to be an object for uh, further uh, prospective studies in the near future. That's it. Thanks so much for your uh, time.